Oh, well, we? right. Thank goodness I can take that damn thing off. Yeah. Oh. But Dan, I gotta ask, uh, back here on Fight Island, does it feel yeah. like uh, returning to the scene of the crime, so to speak? <laughs> I mean, this is kind of like a big thing last time you were here, right? You know, I was only here for a few days last time, and it was one of the most stressful fight weeks I've ever had, just because of, you know, everything around it. I mean, I, 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 I kind of like to plan my fight weeks and know what to expect, and so it was much easier coming back, because I know the hotel and everything like that, but the whole quarantine and all that, it was it was kind of difficult to get my get my head around it, and then trying to get my sleep on track as well. It was just a just an interesting week, a good challenge for me. And then working through the night's always fun and, you know, all the things that came off the back of it. Well, I was going to say, so the Herb Dean situation, obviously that was such a huge, I mean, that was the biggest story in the sport for a while. Two months later, what do you take out? Like, what lessons do you take out of what happened that night and, you know, maybe what you would have done different or where we need to go forward? Like, what lessons do you take out of the whole thing? I mean, the truth is, if I go back to that same day with, without having prior knowledge of that circumstance and uh, that experience of the last Fight Island, I probably wouldn't have done anything different. You know, if you go back to the Herb Dean C uh, when, he was, when he was refereeing CB Dolloway, I was standing up yelling stop the fight during that one as well. Uh, I mean, and that should have been stopped a lot earlier. The, the reality is, like, I have nothing against Herb. He's refereed me a bunch of times, and I know he's a good referee. He's a reliable referee, but he's human. I make mistakes. I say left when it's supposed to be right. I say stupid things in commentary. I called Gunnar Nelson Rick Story once. You know, we're human, we make mistakes. The problem is when you're a referee and when you're looking after the well-being of a fighter, you've got to be on point. And, and at the end of these fights, I just think sometimes we need to review some of these, these circumstances to make sure that, you know, if someone needs to be held accountable for a mistake, then they are. And what, what concerned me about that, I, truth is, I spoke to Herb after the event. I, we, we exchanged respect. I told him that you know I, did, I don't want to I don't want to fall out with him. I don't want to yell at him on the broadcast. Certainly not. And that was my mistake. I shouldn't have yelled at him on the broadcast because I'm I'm there to objectively give my opinion on what's going on. And I was I was giving my opinion to Herb during the fight, which obviously wasn't welcome. But when when he released the video afterwards, which was very kind of nonchalant and like, well, I'm the gold standard of referee, and so you know if you're going to put your Superman T-shirt on, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that concerned me because that means that he's not learning from that mistake and he's going to continue making that mistake. And, you know, if I'm a fighter and I make a mistake, I've got to learn from that mistake or I'm going to get knocked out or submitted in the same way. Unfortunately, the referees go on and, and I don't know whether they're held accountable or not, and that's the issue. Well, that's what I was going to ask, because like, I think we all agree that referee accountability, transparency, education, it's all important. Like you said, mm. we're, I mean, you guys are both passionate about the sport, right? Yeah. I mean, you both love what you do. So, I mean, are, are you going to try to, like, stay involved in, like, talking to commissions and, and trying or, or did the you know did the spotlight of all that make you go ah let me just back away a little bit and make sure these checks are coming in on the broadcast you know? no 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 you, you, you know me I'm, I'm I always say this I, I, I love mixed martial arts I love the UFC I work for the UFC I work for mixed martial arts I'm here for the sport I'm here for the fighters I'm here to protect the industry because I'm an ambassador for the UFC and above all that is my priority we're all here because of mixed martial arts. And, and we've been through the years, you in particular, have been through the years of this should be banned, this and that, and it's dangerous, etc., etc. I just don't want to go back to those days. I don't want to go back to those days because it takes the shine off the, the, the spectacular performances of the fighters. I don't want the, the story out of The Last Fight Island to be me yelling at Herb Dean. I want it to be the fantastic win that Francisco Trinaldo got over Jai Herbert or many of the other performances that we got on that night. I, I'm not here to fall out with people. I'm not, now, I'm, now I'm not a fighter as much anymore. I'm, I'm not here to fall out with officials or anything like that. I'm not. I, but my opinion still stands. If a mistake's made, we need to hold these refs accountable. Very good. Let's talk about great performances. USC 253, uh, Israel out of sign, a fantastic victory. But give us your analysis on it because I think everybody coming out of that is trying to figure out did I sign it just look that good or did Costa have a bad night or a bad game plan? What, what did you take after watching that fight? <laughs> I'd be interested to know what Costa's game plan is. I think, I think it'd be difficult to kind of get inside that camp and find out because obviously they're going to plan on a rematch. They don't want to give anything away. Um, what was interesting is when he went back to his corner after the first round, there was the feeling in the corner like he was doing the right thing. Now, I spoke about it in the war room analysis that I did. I, I, I felt like Costa knows he's probably a three-round fighter. He's probably got that memory of gassing on tough Brazil in the first round, chasing that rear choke and running out of gas. And, if you're a three-round fighter and you're fighting over five rounds, you may not be able to elevate your conditioning to five rounds. You may just have to manage that energy system. So starting hard and going, going fast for three rounds and then having to fight with, you know, when you're gassed and you're trying to defend yourself against Adesanya is not the smart thing to do. So if I was in Costa's corner, I would have probably said the same thing. 
you know, take it easy the first round. Don't give him too much to search on. Don't give him too much research. Don't give him too much to kind of figure out and set you up. But unfortunately, I, I just don't think that Costa had the operating system against Izzy to be able to understand what was going on when he was in the pocket. And uh, you remember when, when Anderson Silva came into the sport, it was like witchcraft. He's like, he's in there and people just don't know what to do. We've got guys like Chris Lieben that come crashing forward, knocking people out couldn't lay a hand on Anderson Silva and there's something very disconcerting about that when you know that you normally close distance and hurt people pretty quickly and you can't touch them I mean I think it was 12 strikes he landed in the total fight it was just a spectacular performance from Izzy he manages range so well and it's so it, I mean, it must be very much like fighting Khabib you can't really understand what his wrestling's like until he's got his hands on you I think when you stand in front of Israel Adesanya you can't really understand what that's like until it's there and when it's there it's too late and you can bring guys in that are the same height, the same reach, they move the same, etc., etc. It's a different thing when it's a live fight and when you've been through the travel and the weight cut and all that kind of stuff. I'd be interested to know more about, about Costa from his side without the animosity between the two, but I, I, think, I think he's going to hold those cards close to his chest. Yeah, that makes sense. So let's go to the main event this week, Holly Holm, Arena Aldana, obviously a big fight in that division, mm -hmm. former champ, top contender. When you're breaking this fight down, what's standing out to you most? Like, what's going to dictate what, what ends up happening here? Well, what's interesting is obviously we've got Holly Holm, who was a standout boxer before she crossed over to mixed martial arts, but really her strength in mixed martial arts is a kicking game. And then we've got Irene Aldana, who really, uh, you know, she, she models herself on a lot of those tough Mexican boxers from back in the day. And I mean, we saw that in a, in a fight against Caitlin Vera, that the speed at which she covered distance, that left hook that she landed, I mean, I, I like a good left hook, you know me, and I, and I can pick fault in most people's left hooks. That was pretty perfect. Like I watched it through a few times last night, slow motion, and as she lands, her hands in the right position, her hips are twisting, her feet are right. I, I think that she's going to try and close distance on Holly Holm and force her to box, and I think that's going to make Holly quite uncomfortable because she tends to like to book uh, bookend those, uh, you know, th that range. Although she likes boxing, her kicking game and her clinch work is really what I think she's going to be using in this fight. Nice, nice thing for me, speaking of the, the big left hook. Come on, you've been teasing a long time, right? You always get asked, I used to get tired of hearing people ask you about it. And now, I mean, is, is, there, is there an expiration date on you fighting again, or is there still one left in the chamber for you? I've, I've always got a fight ready to go. You know, I'm, you know me, I love fighting. I, I love it. And it, it's, been a weird, it's been a weird few years because I feel like I've been in MMA university. I feel like my knowledge has grown exponentially. And as I, as I look back at my old fights, they make me cringe. Like, really, they do. You know, even, even the good performances, I'm like, oh, I was just... I was reckless, I was slow, I was aggressive, I was, I was overconfident, my ego was out of, out of control at times. I mean, the Condit fight, I ran onto his left hook, and that was my fault, purely my fault. But the good thing is I've learned from all of those lessons, and yeah, I'm, I'm a bit older now, but when we're seeing guys like Cowboy and Sanchez in there still, and they're old as well, and they've taken some beatings over the last few years, and I haven't. I mean, my, my grain matter's solid, and I've, I'm, I'm healthy, I've not drank for... for 22 years, you know what I mean? I, I just don't feel like a 38-year-old fighter because I'm not. I'm not a 38-year-old fighter. I was a 32-year-old fighter and I'm a 38-year-old analyst. Stepping back in there as a 38-year-old fighter, I'm a different animal entirely. And with some of the names that are popping back up in the sport right now, I mean, there are some mouth-watering matchups out there and I would definitely jump in with a couple of them. Are you having discussions with them at all? I haven't started yet, but this is the first time I've, uh, I've, I've, uh, I've been back in the UFC bubble in a little while since, uh, since Fight Island last time, so we'll see. There'll be some conversations this week. I've got a pen ready to sign a contract anyway. You mentioned uh, uh, Donald Cerrone, Diego, and even grouping Tyron Woodley into that. Dana White keeps saying he needs to have that talk with these fighters. So what do you think when you, when you watch their performances and you know what they can do, but then you show what, what they're putting out there in the outcome. I, I don't know what the solution is because we're always covering new ground in mixed martial arts. You know, you know we're, we're a 25 year old sport, so the veterans in the sport, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's unusual to see guys fighting at these kind of ages. I mean, look at Alistair Overeem and the experience that he's had. We're, we're always going into unprecedented waters in mixed martial arts. And I think what we need to do is understand what we do with these veterans, with these, these high level superheroes of the game. The, the likes of Diego and Cowboy and, and Tyron, and maybe not keeping them in the mix with all the all the contenders is the right thing to do. I mean, we talk maybe about masters divisions and that kind of stuff. I just think there are some really good super fights that we could have where we match these guys evenly with each other, so they're not taking on these up and comers. I mean, putting Diego in there with Michelle Pereira was was to build Michelle Pereira from a fantastic knockout was was what that looked like to me. And Diego's toughness kept him in the fight, but he had no business being in there with him. Diego's not going to make a title run. He knows that himself now. I just think we need to start matching these guys better with 
you know, with other people of their same same standing in the sport. And and this this is for the protection of those athletes as well, because if you then if you then release Diego or BJ or Cowboy, whoever, someone's going to snap them up, and there'll be there'll be a, there'll be a, a snack for somebody else on a, on a different event because they're going to get a killer, you know, a, a young nine and O guy that's ready to take their head off. I mean. Jake Matthews got a great opportunity to fight Diego Sanchez, but it wasn't Diego Sanchez that he was watching when he was 11. You know what I mean? It's a different guy. Um, I, I would like to see some of these older guys matched up against one another, and I think a veteran division would be awesome. Do you think it is up to the UFC to have, as Dana Wade has, refers to it, that talk with them, like to kind of pull them back? Yeah, I think so. I, I, I think so. I think, I mean, Dana, Dana loves the fighters and he has a responsibility to, to look after these guys that are, that are, you know, that are working for him and also under his care to, to an extent. And Dana does a good job with that. You know, you know we, we all remember what happened with Chuck Liddell and, and, and that was the right thing to do. The, the, fighters never want to retire. I, I've, had, I've had a conversation with Conan Silveira and he said he'd take a fight this weekend if he could. You know what I mean? It's like, like we, we love fighting and we always see ourselves as the 18-year-old that's a spring chicken. Um, th there is there is a time when when fighters do need to realise that Father Time's catching up with them, and, and what we do about that is, I mean, that's really Dana White's decision. But having a talk from Dana and, and being realistic about where their where their position is in the sport is a great thing for him to do. And then you also mentioned like you wanted the shine to be on the martial arts, the aspect of, of the fighting. Uh, what did you make of Israel Adesanya's celebration at the end with the dry humping and running over to Captain Eric? And it seems to kind of <laughs> ruffled a lot of feathers online. Yeah, I mean. It was it was it was crass is the truth. It was unnecessary and it was crass and it's not good for the sport to be seeing those things. But at the same time, you know, we see a lot of the superstars. They stand out. They create headlines because of the things that they do. I mean, you know, he was urinating on the octagon in his, in his UFC debut. You, you know, you know what I mean. It's like we, we shouldn't be surprised by these things. There's a lot of animosity between these guys, and and you know, we do act out when when uh, we do act out when we're when we're in these scenarios. When you 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 know you're um, your adrenaline's up, you've just won the fight, you've got all this energy. I mean, how many times do you see people doing terrible dances after fights and stuff? I've done it myself. You don't know what you're saying in interviews because your adrenaline's going, you just blah. It happens, you know. Sometimes it's difficult to keep control of yourself in those circumstances, but that's when, that's when, you know, you see people and when you see someone like that and you kind of think, well, it wasn't in the spirit of martial arts and really that's what we want to be seeing to represent the sport as a whole. But ultimately, you know, these people have to be their individual selves. Hello, mate. Um, first question is, um, I'm sure you stick to death of all of these questions about your comeback, but I am fascinated by the idea of you against Nick Diaz. Can you give me a one-minute war room on how you see that going? Okay. Um, so obviously Diaz has got a he's got a high work rate. He's got an excellent ground game, and this kind of goes for both the Diaz brothers. They're they're, they're a bit of a clone of one another. Um, they've got a high volume of striking, and that is really what they use in in place of their wrestling you know they, they don't they don't grapple with people to the floor to then employ their, their jiu-jitsu they beat them up on the feet until they level change or shoot or lower their head or whatever i don't think i would see anything different from nick diaz i think he would come out and he would try and slap me up like he did paul daly and i think he would try and back me up against the fence and want to trade punches i, I think the difference is that my hands are faster and i hit a lot harder and and um i i don't make bad decisions like i used to so my head movement's much better now and and I just feel like I could manage range so much better against him uh, than, than a lot of people do. Um, but, I mean, who knows? Who knows what Diaz is doing? He's going to be in good shape. He's got great conditioning. We know he's a good boxer. We know he's got good, a good jiu-jitsu. But ultimately, it comes down to the individual punches that land, and I feel like I could land the individual punches to do the, do the damage. So, as somebody who didn't start or really ever intend to get into the punditry analysis and interviews, what tips would you give yourself if I could go back to that, that first UFC London, I'd say, dude, you're going to make some mistakes. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You're going to make some mistakes. It happens. I mean, fortunately, I was sitting in the seat octagon side in an arena that I'd already been knocked out in the first round. So, it's, you know, I knew, I knew from that point it wasn't going to get any worse than UFC 120. Um, so that kind of made things a little easier for me. But, I mean, we make mistakes. I think that's the easiest thing for, the, for me to, easiest bit of information for me to pass on. Don't expect to be perfect because you won't be. Um, you're going to call people the wrong name. You're going to say stupid things. You're going to make mistakes. It, it is what it is. It's a high energy atmosphere. It's, and, and the other thing people don't realize is when we're on a broadcast, we're working for a solid few hours. It's probably longer than any other commentator in any other sport. So 
if you stick if you stick a microphone in something in front of somebody's face and you let them talk long enough, they're always going to say something stupid. They're going to stutter. They're going to stumble over their words. Don't sweat it. Laugh at yourself. Awesome. <laughs> so lastly, from me, can you let me know like the ethos behind your brand, Full Reptile, what it stands for, what it means to you? It's uh, it's it's the uh, it's it's. It's talking about the reptilian brain. That's where it, where it originally came from. I mean, it's it's developed in various different ways. But you know, sometimes and Robbie Lawler and Vandalay Silver are always my two examples. Sometimes you get a fighter who steps into the octagon, and they're in, they're automatically full reptile. They're automatically disengaging the the old and the new mammalian brain, and they're going straight into that survival method. And that is a real strength in mixed martial arts because when you're training in the gym, I mean, you probably maintain about 20% of your skill. So. What I think in my, in my head is you're kind of training your reptile in those circumstances, and that is what you're relying on to then react in those quick scenarios. If I've then got two different parts of my brain engaged, I've got this cross chatter which is slowing me down, and, and the, the, the best performances are when people are in that flow state. And I've only been there a couple of times. I mean, when, when Dwayne Ludwig caught with that right hand and nearly knocked me out in that, in that fight, I realized once I clinched him and got him up against the fence that I was working on autopilot. And then I'm like, I'm kind of a passenger in my reptilian brain, allowing it to work for itself. Um, so that's kind of what the, the full reptile thing is, to be fully in the reptilian brain. Thank you. Just one for me. I know like Conor McGregor doesn't like uh, easy fights, but he called out um, Sanchez. Do you think he, he regrets that? Yeah, I think, I think he might. I think he might. I mean, you know, he's, he's gone back and double, he's, he's, he's reinforced it by, by saying he'd still want that fight. But... Who knows what Connor's thinking? I, I, I don't know. He, he, he loves a headline, and if a week goes by without him being in the headlines, he's going to do something outlandish to, to, to garner some attention. Um, and I think that's what that was. I, I mean, it would be it would be an execution to put Connor in there with with uh, Sanchez at this point. Um, and, and I don't think Connor would really gain anything from it. You know, there are lots of other good fights out there. I mean, Poirier being one of them. But I would like to see that in mixed martial arts in the octagon, to be honest, at, at 155. Um, yeah, it, 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 was a, it was a weird thing to do. And I think when you've got that kind of stature, you, you've got to be really careful who you're calling out and how you're doing it, because it can really reflect badly on you. And, and I saw a comment from the Fight Disciples earlier today. Connor fighting Manny Pacquiao is not going to look good on Connor because everyone loves Pacquiao. You know what I mean? It's, it's not going to be great for his brand, and, and he's going to have to play the heel in that one. So it's almost like he's taken on that role a little bit. Say, ask you to play UFC matchmaker for Costa next. Mm. If you had to pick out these three fights, you put it against the loser of Hamantan Till, the loser of Cannonier Whitaker, or Kelvin Gastelum. I think Kelvin Gastelum is a very interesting one because I think they occupied the same kind of ranges. I mean, Gastelum is an excellent boxer. He covers distance very quickly, puts his hands together very well. Uh, Costa does the same thing, but obviously he's, he's a bigger, more more powerful individual for this weight class. I mean, there's no way Costa would ever make welterweight, whereas obviously Gastelum, Gastelum wasn't, potentially could be a, still a welterweight. Um, that's the one that makes the most sense to me, um, especially because Gastelum's kind of floating around a little bit. Um, the the Cannoneer Whitaker one's going to be a fascinating fight, and I, and I could see either of them, uh, either of them stepping in and, and taking on Costa next. Um, but ultimately, I think we need to, we need to see Costa over five rounds. M more than anything, it doesn't really matter who he's fighting. W whenever someone's stepping into a title fight, I always want to see them step on the scales at championship weight and be booked for a five-round fight, even if it doesn't go five rounds, because it changes the way you train. And, I, and I, I felt like a lot of the hesitation from Costa in this in this recent fight was because he was kind of managing his energy systems because he didn't want to be gassed with Adesanya in there. Obviously, every time someone fights for a title and they, they come up short, they're sort of just disregarded almost immediately. Like, I feel like Costa's now, oh, he's just one of the rest. But, you know, we anticipated this berserker style from him. So if you now take that style didn't work because he fainted him out and he couldn't get in. So who out of the, the other guys I just mentioned, like Cannonier, Whitaker, Till and Hermanson, who, who could threaten Izzy if you had to pick one? Well, I, I think there are two really interesting ones. I mean, don't get me wrong. A, a fight with Darren Till would be very interesting, but I think Darren needs a couple of wins in this division to, to position himself. Um, Jack Hermanson would be a fascinating one because he's got a very unusual style. He's always very aggressive, but ultimately he wants to close distance and work that joker team. And, and I think we'd, we need to see someone really challenge Izzy in the clinch and on, on the ground. And, and Hermanson might be that guy. I mean, he, he, he almost put uh, Jacare out and he did sub Brunson. So, uh, uh, Branch. Branch, he sub-branch, didn't he not, with that Joker team? Yeah, he got Gaston as well. Oh, Gaston, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think that would be an interesting one. If Cannonier comes through Whitaker, though, he's the first one to put in there for me because the way that he fights, 
he, he walks people down very calm and everything that comes he blocks. And the thing that, that, that Costa was missing this weekend was, was checking low kicks. And Cannoneer blocks low kicks with his shins. And that is the quickest way to put somebody off kicking you. Because the kicker almost always comes off worse when you block a kick correctly. Um, I, I think Cannoneer, I mean, he's the dark horse in this division. And the difference between him and Costa, as, as powerful as Costa looks, all of his wins are TKOs. He's not sparking people with one punch. Cannoneer was doing that at heavyweight. I mean, that, that left hook that he landed on Cyril Aske and knocked him out cold. And, and for him now transferring down to the, in, into middleweight, He's still got that punching power, but now he's not got that extra 40-odd pounds on his frame. He's just much, much faster with it. I think he's an interesting matchup for sure. Is it safe to say that could be the fight that we thought Costa Adesanya could be? Yeah, quite possibly, but it won't be as aggressive. It won't be as wild as what we were expecting from Costa. And I think that's what made us excited, is that we thought Costa was going to really pour volume onto Adesanya and back him up against the fence. Um, I don't think Cannonier is going to do that. He's going to be far more calm and collected and pick his shots. But against someone like Adesanya, that's going to make me more excited because, I mean, you know, like I was saying before the fight, I, I just don't think Costa had the, the, the understanding of the striking range to cause Izzy problems, whereas I think Cannonier, even, even if he's only got a small skill set, he uses it very, very well and he understands the application of the techniques. Going back to the States during broadcast, what were the hardest names for you to pronounce? Because you've seen oh. fighters from all over the world. <laughs> You know, you know, the, the most difficult thing is trying to is trying to settle on a pronunciation. That's that's been the biggest battle because you know often we'll sit in a room with the other commentators and we'll go through the names, and we won't agree. I mean, John Gooden and I, we could practically headbutt each other until we disagree on on pronunciations, and it's still the same. You know, is, is it Kovalkovic? Is it Kovalkevich? Is it Blahovic? Is it Blakovic? I mean, you know, we get the name files through, but you could even listen to the name files and, and have a different interpretation. Just generally, the names are quite difficult. I, I tend to, what I tend to do is I tend to go back into their early career and I look for fights in the region that they're from and hear the announcer, the, the, the MC, announce their name in their native language and then I get a good idea of really how to say it. But honestly, the Polish names have been the more challenging ones, really. But I'm, I'm kind of getting around it now. I, I, can't, I still can't say Joanna's last name. I start, every time I see her, I go, Jedrzejczyk, Jedrzejczyk, and she's like, nope, nope. So, you know. I'll get it eventually, but I think Joanna's is still the more difficult name for me. Even more than Russian names? Yeah, I think so. I don't know why. It's just all the C's and the Z's and the Y's put together. It, I, I look at it and it just doesn't make sense to me. It's very, very difficult for me to understand. Um, but fortunately, the, the, the Polish fighters have been very, uh, very forgiving of me. And Jan always laughs at me when I'm trying to say Polish names anyway. And my good friend Pavel gives me a, gives me a hand when, it, when he can. But... Um, I'm, I'm not an expert at pronouncing names. I, I'm, I'm, I try to be an expert at breaking down fights, and unfortunately, I have to say fighters' names in that process, which does make me look a bit stupid sometimes. The well, UFC always asks fighters to actually pronounce their own names the way they pronounce. Yeah. Do, do you get those files to hear? Yeah. You yes, we do. But a good example is Darren Till and Darren Stewart. They're from different ends of, of the UK, and the UK is tiny in comparison to some countries. So if I've got someone from the north and the south of China with the same name, Zhang, they're going to say it very, very differently. So do I say Darren, like Darren Stewart, or do I say Darren, like Darren Till? <laughs> I have to say it how I say it, which is Darren, and that's kind of the middle ground. You know, like when I was in the US train, everyone was calling me Don, because they thought that was what I was saying when I said Dan. Um, it's, you know... It's a fun part of the sport. Fortunately, we get to speak to a lot of the fighters fight week, and if I'm unsure, this is why you see me announcing the weigh-in sometimes on Friday mornings, because as the fighters are coming up, I, um, if I'm unsure, I say, say your name to me. Say, say your name to me as you'd say it to somebody else. And they, when they repeat it a couple of times, I can usually just make the same noise. Retaining it for the next day is the challenge, though. <laughs> How's it? All good? Good. Thank awesome. you, everybody. Thank you.